So we're just about a minute before 10. And so I'm just going to kind of roll into the presentation today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Ruth Beck, and I'm an agronomy field specialist based out of Pierre. Um, I've been here for about 17 years, and um, a great part of my career has been working with sunflower pr uh, producers in this area. So uh, I've enjoyed that part a lot. Um, anyways, uh, as we get going here, our speaker today is Dr. Fabina um, Matthew, and she is a Associate Professor and Field Crops Pathologist at SDSU in Brookings. Um, she focuses on diversity and management of pathogens that cause diseases in broadleaf crops in South Dakota. Um, she does research on the biology of those pathogens, uh, what that cause the diseases of broadleaf crops. And she also looks at strategies to manage those diseases like fungicides, host resistance. Um, her primary crops of responsibility include cowpeas, camelina, canola, carinata, chickpea, corn, dry edible bean, lentil, field pea, flax, soybean, and sunflowers. So she covers a lot of ground there. Um, She's still in her early career and had a, had a lot of success, and she's received awards um, from the American Phytopathological Society for an early career award. Um, she's been a face of the future in host resistance and host pathogen interaction, and she's been inducted to the South Dakota chapter of Honor Society of Agriculture. And she's also been nominated for excellence with working with graduate student students. So. Um, Fabina uh, has been a great asset to our organization. She uh, runs both the variety trials for sunflowers and also does a lot of work with diseases in that crop. So um, she's gonna start here in a minute. Um, before we get going, Fabina, you could share your screen, but uh, I'm just gonna again, tell people what Matt, what Matt was running through in the presentation. Um, we're gonna, if you wanna have a question uh, and would like to, um, direct that to Fabina or any of us really who are on today. Um, just during the presentation, we encourage you to put those in the question and answer feature or in the chat below. Um, you can see those, you can type those in and we'll address those at the end of Fabina's presentation. Um, there'll be, there are CCA credits associated with this presentation and we'll share those at the end of the presentation as well when we're Talk, doing some of the question and answers. And then if people want to stay on for a while um, after we're through some of those housekeeping things at the end, um, our tech team will make you, um, will bring you into our discussion, I guess, in, um, into our room. And then you can unmute yourself and you can ask questions if you want. And Fabina and, and I, and I see Adam Varenhorses who are our our entomologist and Pat Wagner, who's the entomologist out west, um, we can all, you know, address those questions as they come in. So um, I encourage you to stay on, and, and maybe we'll have some good discussion at the end of the, of the presentation. But looks like Fabina's ready to go, so I'm going to mute myself, and I'll let you start, Fabina. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, I just wanted to check that I'm audible. Can I get a thumbs up from one of you? You sound good, I can hear you. All right, thank you, Ruth. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Um, I don't know um, how the weather is in the area that you are, but we're pretty sunny here up in Brookings and the weather is expected to go up to 50, 60. So it's, uh, it sounds like we nearly have spring or somewhere around the corner. It's kind of getting hot, I believe, but it's just beautiful weather and a beautiful time to think about planting. And uh, sunflower is definitely one of the top crops um, based on some of the data that they have coming in from 2020. Um, it is one of the most profitable crops currently in the United States. And that's good news, especially considering the prices for sunflower in the market, regardless of whether you are planting oils or non-oils. Today, I will be covering two topics of the sunflower growth stages, which is important, especially if you are using fungicides to manage diseases. And then I call it sunflower diseases 1.0. 
and that's just because um, you know of the most of the the diseases that I will be talking about are the are those that I have seen in the last five years while I've been at um, SDSU. So without further delay, I'm just going to get started. Looks like my screens. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to start with the sunflower growth stages. Um, sunflower plants in general, they go through about four main developmental stages. When we take it from the day you have planted the crop until harvest. And those four stages include a vegetative phase, a reprodu reproductive phase or an adult phase when the budding happens. And then the crop goes through a period of ripening and then finally senescence when the crop gets ready for harvest. So when one asks uh, evaluates the growth stage, one of the key things to do would be to get out to the field and check at the, you know, take a group of plants to make that assessment what growth stage your crop may be at. If you'd use a single plant and maybe look far ahead into the field, you might see that the crop may be at like uh, two growth stages at least. So it's always better to use representative samples. You definitely would want to avoid headlands um, where soil compaction is very common since it can affect the crop growth and also patches of uneven growth. The uneven growth could be because of disease issues or insect issues or fertility or hail damage or anything that can just cause unevenness in the crop production during that growing season. In general, a lot of the commercial hybrids that we get in the market today, they tend to grow very uniform across the field. So it is not difficult to determine the growth stages. And this is like my go-to sheet for growth stages. Um, so what I have here includes the vegetative and reproductive growth stages. So uh, this is kind of number, numbered from one through 14. One, um, when, the, when the seedling phase, as in the seeds germinate and the crop just emerges out of the ground, we call it VE, E standing for emergence. And this would be a V2 stage where you have two true leaves. And as we go through the vegetative phase, we typically count the number of true leaves on the plant. So this would be like two true leaves. This would be like four. Um, and then when you see a um, floral head sitting on the plant, that's what we call an R1 growth stage. So it is like a floral head sitting on the plant. Um, and it is surrounded by four big giant leaves. And then at this stage, you have an R2. It kind of mimics the cabbage, if you will, uh, sitting on the plant, really. And then from that floral head is what forms the miniature head. And as we go along, this is different phases of the reproductive growth stages. And when you see the sunflowers literally basically facing the sun, that's what we call the R5 stage. And that's the flowering stage or the bloom stage. But R5 is again broken up uh, into sub growth stages. And so we have, this would be a R5.1 when the bloom is, when the flower is like slowly opening up. And then this would be more of a R5.5. And then this is the end of the uh, flowering stage, which we call R, um, R5.9. And then as you move along, uh, the sunflower starts to go through the ripening phase. And then when it hits the R9 stage, this is, uh, you know, when that is when we say the crop's kind of ready for harvest. So the vegetative phase, typically uh, when we plant in June, as far as the South Dakota calendar, uh, the vegetative phase lasts for at least four to six weeks by I want to say third week of July, early August, the sunflowers are getting ready to go into the reproductive growth stages. And as far as disease management is concerned, the reproductive growth stages are very critical because the timing of fungicide application will make a huge difference when it comes to yield benefit. Um, the, R, uh, the R5 stage, that is when the sunflowers flower, it's also important to keep track of that decimals, 5.2, 5.7, because even that has role in managing a few diseases that we're gonna talk about in a little bit here. Um, as uh, the R5 stage, that is when the sunflower, you know, um, is in a full bloom, looks very pretty, that typically lasts for about three weeks. 
And then we get to the harvest um, in October, November, really dependent on when you have planted the sunflowers. So that's what the growth stages, and I'm going to quickly switch over the slides to sunflower diseases. Um, so I came from NDSU. I have my PhD uh, from North Dakota, and um, uh, and and, and, I, and I'm, I want to say I'm a huge fan of both the bisons and the jackrabbits. It's kind of tough to take the pick when they both play, but um, but you know it's 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 all well. So, but. When it comes to sunflower production, we tend to see similar thing. It's it's more or less like a competition between the two states. Um, in one year, North Dakota uh, beats the record, and next next year it's South Dakota. In 2020, I believe North Dakota led the sunflower production in the United States. Uh, previous five years, that is from 2014 to 2019, South Dakota was number one. Um, but overall, if you include little portion of Minnesota that's in the Crookston area, East Grand Forks into North Dakota and South Dakota, we have 80% of the commercial sunflower production in the United States. And that's, so that pushes sunflower to be a significant crop for the producers in this region. Now, as we talk about North Dakota and South Dakota, um, a lot of this data comes from the National Sunflower Association. This is uh, the, the small triangle circles that you see on the screen on the right side where the cursor is moving. It's pretty much where the sunflower production takes place in the two states. In South Dakota, a lot of the sunflower fields are centered around peer area. You look, check the direct, direction if it's in the north, south, east, west. We have a lot of sunflowers that is grown in this area and it tends to expand um, depending on you know uh, if the producers are planting or not. But there is a lot of production that takes place in other states too, like Nebraska, um, Colorado, uh, right, right here, and a little bit um, south of that, all the way up to Texas. So this, there is enough production in the United States, making it to uh, the total area harvested to be nearly 2 million acres on an yearly basis, give or take. Now, as we think about the number of fields that is in the Dakotas or uh, compare it with what they have down in Texas, one of the key things to remember is that we have cooler conditions up in the north. Compare that with the um, conditions down in Texas with the exception of the, um, the um, storm that they had in the recent weeks. Um, they tend to be relatively drier and warmer compared to us. And as a result of that, we do see different types of diseases occurring in the north versus south. So as an example, you've got downy mildew, uh, former black stem, phomopsis, rust, sclerotinia diseases, but head rot's been picking up in the last couple of years that I have seen in the Dakotas. Um, and compared that with Texas, rust, def, dust and phomopsis tends to be common, but we also see rhizopus head rot and verticillium wilt to be more prevalent um, in the south. So today, uh, uh, what I have uh, would be a list of, uh, I've got about uh, five diseases that I will be talking about. And these diseases are been um, in South Dakota, I want to say like in the last five years, I've seen several of these diseases affecting farmer fields. So I have uh, Phomopsis stem canker, rust, stratinia diseases. Um, downy mildew and former black stem. So for Phomopsis stem canker, my program does uh, a lot of research on Phomopsis. We look at both fungicides and host resistance. This particular disease was described in the United States in mid 1980s, I want to say, and it was kind of historically dismissed off because it, the prevalence was very low. People didn't see anything uh, that the disease was doing to compromise yield. But suddenly came 2010 when there was a disease epidemic and it did crush the production in the Dakotas and Minnesota. So what Phomopsis really does is that when we think about symptoms, it shows up on the plant when the sunflowers are at the R1 growth stage. R1 growth stage is where the miniature floral head is. And I will have a follow-up picture here in a little bit. But it begins with some necrosis that is developing on the leaf. And over time, what you would see, the necrosis moves along the veins to reach to the petiole. And then it forms this characteristic canker-looking lesion on the sunflower stem. 
it's kind of hard to tell from looking on the leaves whether you have stem canker or not because there are several diseases that can mimic the same symptoms. So um, this lesion on the stem is a telltale way of saying you've got formopsis and we usually don't see that until the flowers are blooming. So this is an example um, of a field that has been taken down by Formopsis and this is, uh, this is actually in Brookings. I have a Formopsis nursery that's just five minutes north of the campus where we do a lot of the fungicide evaluations and screen germplasm for resistant to Formopsis, but this is what it does. Uh, the, the sunflowers, um, this is a susceptible hybrid and under high disease pressure, um, you know, triggered by rainfall a humidity of 90% or greater um, you would tend to see, and you have, you know, the inaculum present in the soil, you can see that the disease can literally take down the sunflowers in a way that it can wilt and lodge the crop, leading to yield reduction. Typically, we see yield losses up to 40%, um, but even more have been uh, reported in certain countries of the world. Another thing that we have noticed um, is the differences in the, you know, the size of the head and head weight. So this on the right side is the picture of a healthy sunflower head. One on the left is basically is the seed diameter is kind of reduced by half. And, and these have, the ones on the right have been harvested from plants that were affected by Formopsis. Um, so, so there is a difference in the seed weight and the seed um, diameter and eventually all that translate to yield losses. So Formopsis is caused by multiple fungi and we have two fungal pathogens that are prevalent in South Dakota. And these are Formopsis genianti and um, Formopsis gouillie. Um, in general, we've got three fungicide chemistries that are labeled to manage foliar diseases of sunflower and they include FRAC11 and I have an example uh, that's headline. We've got a FRAC7 STHI, with an example is Endura. And we've got a FRAC3 triazole, which is in the example is Follicure. So these are the chemistries that are labeled um, on all field crops and sunflower is no exception. And so just as a quick reminder for the growth stage, what I have here on the left side is more of a V6, V8. It's taken at an angle, so it tends to be a little taller than this, but somewhere between V6 and V8. The one right here where the cursor is moving is what I call a R5, or at least the beginning stages of R5. So this here is the R1 growth stage. And so for Formopsis symptoms, you typically start to see the symptoms when sunflowers are at R1. And then you start to see the stem lesions when the crop enters the R5 growth stage. So one of the things that we did, um, so when I say we, it's a multi-state collaboration. So we do fungicide trials in Minnesota, Nebraska, North Dakota, and South Dakota. We did it for over five years. Um, a total of 52 um, trials were analyzed statistically. And we sprayed periclostrobin. Periclostrobin is the active ingredient present in headline um, and compared it with when you don't spray fungicide. So, uh, the, the key observations that we had was that for 76% of the 52 trials that we analyzed data for, we saw significantly lower disease severity um, in the fungicide treated plots. And for 61% of the trials, we saw greater yield. So when I say greater yield, we're talking about at least a 5% increase in yield compared to when you do not spray uh, fungicide. So uh, overall, the and this is a single application of periclostrobin that we are talking about at R1 growth stage, and it reduced the disease severity by 37%. Uh, we uh, saw yield benefit of about 5%, um, but the effect was not statistically significant. So this is the difference um, we see. So the one I have on the right side is a non-treated check where fungicide was not sprayed. And sunflower is kind of hammered by Formopsis stem canker. The seeds are drooping and maybe a slight push with your thumb can just literally push the sunflower down. One on the right side, on the left side is where I have a headline sprayed plots. You can see the, dif the difference, the leaves are a little greener. Um, the stem looks a lot cleaner compared to the non-treated check. 
So this is uh, this data is coming out of my trial. So it's it's very dramatic. Like you, so uh, you can literally pick out the plots where the fungicide was sprayed and where the fungicide was not sprayed. So taking lead that the fungicides are effective at R1 growth stage against Formosus stem canker, we've been trying different chemistries. Um, all these chemical chemicals were uh, obtained from different companies and they were sprayed at the recommended rate. And if you notice the three chemistries that we have in each of these chemicals would be uh, frac three, seven or 11. So three would be your triazole, seven would be your STHI and 11 is your QI. What we saw for a reduction in disease severity are products that contains periclostrobin. Granted headline is um, may not may be phased out now in the coming years, but they may be available in the co-ops. But there are a few products that's coming out from BASF that contains periclostrobin that seems to be as effective as um, the headline. But overall, what we saw was a significant reduction in disease severity. So in here, taller the bar means the, uh, the disease pressure was high, no fungi the fungicide did not work, but short of the bar means the fungicide had some effect on it. In terms of yield, um, we are looking at taller bars. So the non-treated control, meaning where the fungicide did not, uh, was not sprayed, did not yield as much. This was a confection hybrid, so we're seeing only a 1,500 pounds per acre. Compare that with any product containing periclostrobin, we're at least seeing a 200 to 500 pound per acre increase. So if you convert that again, in terms of prices, we are looking at a profit of $250 per acre. If, uh, if Especially if your field has got a history of a muscle stem canker and you choose to spray a fungicide containing periclostrobin at R1, a single application can basically do the wonders. The other few things that we did as part of the fungicide trial, and I'm gonna take uh, you through a little bit of science here. So um, I don't know if anybody has ever often wondered why a leaf, um, especially when it comes to diseases, why do we see these three categories? So you have a dead leaf, a stressed leaf, and a healthy leaf. Now we see a healthy leaf to be green. And that's just because the light that falls onto the healthy leaf uh, usually reflects two type of radiations, two type of radiations of different wavelength. That is your green and your near infrared. So typically the near infrared tends to be a little longer as compared to green, but just because our eyes cannot pick up the NIR, which is the near infrared, we can only see the green portion. So a healthy leaf appears to be green. Compare that with a dead leaf or a stressed leaf, the near infrared is not reflected as much. And so we don't necessarily get to see any of the, uh, we don't uh, get to see the color at all on the leaf and that's why we call it a dead leaf. So picking up on this is how the remote sensing technology has been built up. And we've got a couple of uh, tools that we play with. One is called the Green Seeker. And I don't know how many of you have used this, but this is a very common tool that uh, people typically use to assess the nitrogen fertility in uh, cereal crops, at least based off the research that's out there. Um, and so one of the things that we did this past summer was to see if Green Seeker could be used as an alternative to us telling if the crop is doing well or not. So the key thing to remember is that when we stand out, look at our plots uh, or look at the crop in a field, you know, if we pretty much go with what our eyes can see, but we can only see the seven colors. So something that is green is only going to be green. But what this tool does is it's going to quantify that greenness and tell us if the crop's healthy or not. It may not necessarily tell us that the crop is affected by soil fertility, soil compaction, diseases, insects, but it's just going to tell you if the crop's healthy or not. So you can relate this to like a thermometer, for example, like if your body temperature is greater than 98.6, we'd say we are, we, we are not feeling well, we've got flu. Similarly, if uh, this tool gives you a value anywhere between 0.6 to a negative value, it's a sign that your crop probably is not doing well. Ideally, the, this value that we see on the green seeker is called NDVI, and you have, can have values anywhere between minus one to one. 
So anything greater than 0.65 means the crop's doing very well. Anything below that means the crop's struggling a little bit. And one may have to go out there and check to see what exact factor is compromising the health. Another few things that we did is the use of drones. Um, we've got multispectral sensors in the uh, department. Um, they are cameras that kind of takes pictures. Um, and this is just recreated uh, from, um, uh, from one of the company websites. You can see there are two different colors that's out there. One is called the NDVI and another is the NDRE. The difference really is in the wavelength that the sensor picks up. So the NDVI reads off the near infrared and NDRE reads the red edge. The purpose of both the vegetation indices is the same. They are really indicators of crop health. Um, this is really helpful when you have thousands and thousands of acres of land. It might be a little difficult to get out the green seeker. For the purpose of research, green seeker is great because we could just you know, quickly run it and get a feel of how the crop's doing. But if you have thousands and thousands of acres, getting a camera might be beneficial. And that's where the multispectral cameras come in. Um, so the values tend to be the same between the two vegetation indices, uh, minus one to one, typically. Um, the only difference between the two is NDVI is good if you want to assess the top part of the canopy. NDRE gives you more of a perspective on how your entire plant is doing. So it goes, it penetrates deep into the canopy. But if you are totally new to this remote sensing technology, these are some of the tools that is out there that can be used for starters. And then um, if you decide that I want to specifically know if I can differentiate between say diseases and weeds, for example, then you've got new technology that's coming out like for example, the hyperspectral sensors or artificial intelligence. Uh, regardless, we used both the uh, green seeker and um, the drone images this year to kind of get a feel of how the fungicides are behaving or if they have, if they can improve the crop vigor. And so what I have here is the control right on the right side. The, without spring fungicide, we didn't see much improvement in the crop vigor, but use any of these chemicals. Um, it seems that there was a difference in the crop vigor after the fungicide was sprayed. And this is NDRE. Um, we're seeing some similar trend. The, uh, uh, you know, the control is right here. The, we are seeing some fungicide that numerically, it seems to have improved the greenness of the crop. And that's very important because if the crop's not doing well, it's not going to be um, synthesizing chlorophyll or it may not be efficient photosynthetically. And as a result of that, you're going to see a compromise in yield. So it is very important to make sure that your crops really doing well, regardless of the stress factors that you have going on you know, during the growing season. Another thing that we did in 2020, and uh, this project was funded through the South Dakota Oil Seed Council, we uh, checked to see if the fungicide application could be improved on sunflowers using different nozzle types. So we use three types of nozzle types. Um, we've got the Holocone, flat fan, and twin jet. We used to spray, we use multiple spray pressures. These came from the manufacturer recommendations. And the water volume was adjusted accordingly on the high boy sprayer. So what we saw for a disease reduction, um, and then this is an oil seed hybrid, we saw the disease pressure was about a 63%. Compare that with any of the nozzles uh, sprayed at high pressure, we saw there was a reduction in um, disease. So 63.5 versus Holocon on a high pressure gave us a, a significant reduction in disease. Um, also, we saw some yield benefit um, from uh, spraying any uh, of these, uh, spraying using any of these nozzles at higher pressure. So some of the examples would be Holocon at 90 PSI or flat fan at 55, 90. We're seeing an increase of at least 300 pounds per acre. Um, so that's, uh, that's with the different nozzle types. We also tried the same on the confection hybrid. We did see some reduction in disease, um, especially when you use the nozzle types at a higher pressure but we did not see any differences in yield. Maybe numerically you would see some differences, like for example, 
when fungicide was not sprayed, it, was, it gave us about a 2,000 pounds per acre. You compare that with a holocon at 90 PSI, we saw about 2,400 some. So it's nearly about a 300, 350 pound per acre increase. But statistically, it was not significant. So with, uh, so that's with the fungicides. Uh, so we've got like one chemistry that is working. Um, we recommend spraying pericostrobin at R1. You're free to use any nozzle types, but, pre but preferably at high pressure. Um, but one of the things that we want to really emphasize on is the use of hybrids, especially if you're into organic farming. Hybrid selection is very important. Um, this is something that one could check with the seed dealers to see if there is resistance available with Formopsis stem canker. Most of the commercial hybrids that we have available in the market today have got partial resistance, meaning they don't have complete resistance to the causal fungi, but they can tolerate the disease to a certain level that you will still see some yield benefit. Also, the other factor that we strongly, strongly recommend is crop rotation. Um, of, of course, nobody does sunflower after sunflower, but rotating with non-hosts such as wheat uh, would definitely try to bring down the inaculum. And so that's something that we recommend when it comes to management of Formopsis stem canker. So um, that's Formopsis. Um, another disease that is of economic importance is the sunflower rust. And um, this is what it looks like on the, um, under, this is under the microscope, but these brown dots that kind of resembles the cinnamon specks would be rust. So if you, if you move, if you uh, use your thumb and kind of spread that brown dots, you would, it basically just smears. And that is a sign to tell you that it is rust. Um, this is on the underside of the leaf. This is a leaf that is totally covered with rust pustules. Uh, this is another picture of it. Um, this is when the leaf is really severe, um, again, on the underside of the leaf. Um, this is definitely not rust. If you notice the symptoms, um, it doesn't resemble the cin cinnamon dots. It looks like uh, more of a diamond-shaped lesion that might be caused by a fungus, but not the rust fungus. These are a few other pictures. Um, this is right on the stem. This would be on the bracts, on the right behind on the sunflower, uh, in front of the sunflower head. This is another picture of what it would look like on the leaf. So again, with a, with a friendly reminder on the growth stage, what I have here on the right side is R1. And if the sunflowers bloom, we've got the R5 growth stage. And with that thought, um, one of the things that we do when before we spray for fung rust fungicide um, is that we do check the disease severity uh, for it. So if the rust severity is 1%, meaning what you see in the leaf, then it's basically time to spray. But that 1% severity needs to be on the upper four leaves. This is a little different from um, stem canker, from opposite stem canker, where we do not assess the disease severity. When the crop is at R1 growth stage, we spray. But for rust, when the crop is at R5, and the disease severity is about 1%, like you would see in the leaf, that would be the time to spray against rust. Um, so one of the, uh, this, is, this research is out of North Dakota. And uh, one of the research uh, that was done by Dr. Sam Markel is where he tried to spray fungicide at multiple growth stages um, before and after R5. So when the fungicide was not sprayed, we saw a disease severity of about 8.7%. And at R5, the reduction is about a 1.3%. So there is definitely a yield difference when you spray at R5 compared that with spraying earlier or later. So what we typically recommend the farmers is that they sprayed at R5, provided the disease severity on the upper four leaves is 1%. Now, um, so in this case here, um, if you consider spraying after the R5, meaning after the fact that the sunflowers are done with bloom, we were not able to reduce the disease in any ways and we did not, and we saw the yield was basically dropping. So any fungicide application after R5, it doesn't seem to be economical. Now for this trial, the research was done using headline. Um, and besides headline, the other, uh, chemical that can be considered would be the use of a triazole. 
So this is a picture uh, from uh, one of the NDSU trials. So what I have on the left side would be the uh, uh, plots where fungicide was not sprayed. There is definitely a mix of formopsis and rust on these trials, but compared it with when headline was sprayed at R5, they did, we did not see much of rust pressure. So that's the difference uh, between spraying fungicide versus no fungicide. Um, so for rust, the, in addition to the QIs, triazoles are also effective. Again, the rust severity, if it reaches one person of the upper four leaves at or before R5, you would want to definitely consider fungicide application. Now, most commercial hybrids that are grown in South Dakota have got resistance to rust. So this would be an information that will be with the seed dealer. It is very important to manage rust if you've particularly seen rust issues in your field. Unlike what we see on wheat, like the stem rust or stripe rust, it is not necessary that the spores are going to blow from the south onto your field. It could be that your neighbor must have had it in your in the, in the previous season, or uh, or or you probably have it in your field this particular season, and it can just start from your field itself. It doesn't have to blow from a different state to affect the crop. Another disease uh, that's been of big importance here in South Dakota, maybe gaining importance, um, but relative to North Dakota, it's not been so much of a problem, and that's just because. This particular fungus, what we call the Spertinia striatiorum, loves moisture. And South Dakota, fortunately, can be drier compared to uh, North Dakota. But it, maybe in the last two years, we have been starting to see um, issues from Spertinia wilt or Spertinia head rot. And many of you can relate this particular disease to what we see on soybeans or any of the other broadleaf crop. It is popularly known as white mold. So white mold is, is in, on, on sunflowers, it's got three different uh, names for the same disease. So as I indicated, the, um, the fungus loves it when the you know, environmental conditions are cool and wet, particularly for head rot and stem rot. And the fungus is the same as uh, that causes disease on other broadleaf crops like soybeans, dried up beans, um, field peas, lentils, alfalfa and so on. It, it just, it has got a wide host range. It's, it's known to infect probably most crops that we have growing in South Dakota, except for wheat and corn. So this is just a, just a dramatic uh, visual on what it looks like. There are, uh, this particular fungus causes three different diseases on sunflowers. You've got the basal stem rot, the middle stem rot and head rot. I've got some animation here um, and so, what happens for the basal stem rot is the fungus is soil born. It lives in the soil and then it attacks the sunflower plant that is growing. It germinates and then it causes this kind of lesions um, on the stem. And when you cut the stem open, you can see these black bodies, what we call scrotia. That is an easy telltale way of the fact that you've got spartinia in your field. And these are another picture, some close-up pictures of what it looks like, basal stem rot or spartinia welt. This is the base of the plant. And you can see this black bodies right here. You've got a white cottony thread of the fungus that then converts to these black bodies over time. Then you've got the mid stem rot. Same process, the fungus is soil worn, um, but then it also produces what we call the apothecia that releases the spores and then it infects the um, plants in such a way. This is the apothecia. It infects uh, the plants by through the leaves. Sometimes you can see this kind of lesions on the leaf. Um, and then um, it can also be that the spores are transported in by the wind or any other source to land on the stem and cause this sort of bleaching right on the stem. So this is very typical. Over time, what happens is the stem can just degrade and you can see those black scrotial bodies inside the stems. I've got some more pictures for you. Uh, right on the leaf is basically the scrotinia infection when it came in contact with the stem. And this is another picture where the advanced infection has literally shredded the stem. Um, and uh, and this, is, this is something you can basically even notice from a distance. It basically doesn't have any head or anything on the plant. 
the uh, the, the third disease that this keratinia fungus can cause is what we call the head rot. So pretty much it infects the head. So in this case, the spores that are produced by the fungus is transported by the wind. And when being airborne, it just literally lands on the head and then it causes the infection. So this would be typical of a head rot um, here in uh, South Dakota. So you can see the head is pretty much damaged. Uh, this is all shredded. And what you see for the white portion inside is the sign of the fungus. So overall, regardless of the type of disease this fungus causes in your field, the management has been extremely difficult. And that's not any different from other crops that you can think about, including soybeans. Um, fungicides, they have little or no effect. However, there are fungicides labeled that could be used to manage stratinia head rot. And they're typically sprayed between R5.2 to 5.7. However, the studies that is coming in from NDSU suggests that one year they might see some yield benefit, another year the fungicide does not seem to do anything to protect the crop from um, this fungus. The genetics is, it's, uh, there are commercial hybrids that are available uh, that can tolerate the fungus, meaning they have some level of resistance in them. But the breeders up in North Dakota and also with uh, the private industry breeders are working to improve the genetics. It's going to be very difficult to find a hybrid which has complete resistance to the fungus, but your best bet would be to find something that has some level of resistance in them. Biologicals have been labeled. The most popular biological would be contents, which is a fungus that can feed on the white mold fungus. However, the data is very limited. And again, the efficacy seems to be very varying between location years. Crop rotation becomes very important when it comes to managing white mold. It is very important to include wheat. Wheat is a great source here um, and also corn because these are two crops that are not hosts of the white mold fungus. Then downy mildew, uh, this is a disease that I probably have seen not so much. Uh, typically out of thousand plants, you might find one or two plants that are infected with downy mildew. But I decided to cover anyways, because we just spread apart. Um, northern part of the state probably receives a little more moisture than the Southern part. Uh, but this is what it looks like um, early into the season. It's a seedling disease. This is not caused by a fungus. It is caused by a fungal like organism and it, it, it loves the soil moisture. So anytime you have wet, damp soil and you see um, this kind of a symptom that's right on the right is what we call downy mildew. What I have on the left is a healthy plant. So if you relate it, you can see that is the plant appears very stunted. The lower leaves has got some sort of a discoloration on the leaves and that's all telltale signs of the downy mildew organism. If you flip the leaf, you would see these white patches, white to gray, depending on the light. Um, and so that's another way to say that you have the organism on your crop that is compromising yield. Uh, this is a field in South Dakota. Um, I think it was just maybe half hour east of Pier. Um, right here is your downy mildew um, affected plant. It's appearing standard. There's another one here. The tall sunflowers seems to be healthy. Granted, the field is fairly weedy, um, but the purpose of demonstration here is just pretty much this downy mildew uh, affected plant. And this is very important. The seedling diseases um, can really compromise the yield. There are times when sunflowers can grow out of it, but in most times when the plant is stunted, it gets killed that you can see 100% yield losses. Uh, over time. Um, and, 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 and of course, it depends on how wet the conditions continue to be. This is another picture of a downy mildew affected plant that is taken from the top. What we have for managing is resistance. And I will be talking about a little bit what to ask for seed dealers uh, about when it comes to genetics. We have also got some seed treatments that are currently available in the market that seems to be doing fairly well. Um, that includes the oxytiofibrillin, you have the oxystrobin, and you've got a acibenzolar S-methyl. These are old chemistries. This is relatively new chemistry that's come out. There are other chemistries that has been labeled uh, maybe in the late 90s, early 2000s, but they've started to phase out a little bit. That's just because 
uh, given the sensitivity issue, not of this particular organism, but in the sensitivity issue that's been associated with a few other organisms and other crops. So for genetics, um, what we have uh, would be these. Um, in, currently in South Dakota, we've got a lot of hybrids that's got the PI6 that seems to be, uh, PO6, sorry, that seems to be so effective against uh, races that we have in South Dakota. Um, if you combine the two Dakotas, North and South Dakota, um, still going strong would be the PL5 and PL8, but it will be wise to check with the seed dealer to get a feel of what genetics works best in your area. But in general, it's a PL6 is what we have in South Dakota. And there are a few others that is now coming out uh, that the breeders are starting to incorporate in their hybrids. The best um, gen genes would be anything that contains 17, 16, 15, 13, and ARG. Um, and this is some of the screenings that we did it in 2014 and 2015 when I was a graduate student at NDSU. Um, but they will be continuing to do some monitoring for this uh, organism and also look at different races. And we will be starting off with some research here at SDSU. As far as the C treatments are concerned, um, this is a trial that was done in 2013. And this is again during my V days uh, when I was doing my PhD at NDSU. But what we have here are four location trials. We've got two in Fargo, one in Thompson and Kington. This was an inoculated trial, which means we introduced the organism into the trial. When C treatment was not used, we are seeing disease incidence, meaning the number of infected plant to be anywhere between 45 um, to in, in late 80s. But the use of uh, C treatment uh, seems to reduce the number of uh, infected plants. So you can see a bunch of zeros, ones and twos, which is kind of an indication that the chemistry works. So that's one of the big recommendations that we have uh, for the farmers. If you have a history of downy mildew in your field, consider to use C treatments. They are effective. It, uh, they are effective at least for about uh, 14 to 21 days. They will definitely protect the crop from downy mildew and also help with the initial emergence. Um, if you manage, if you if one decides not to manage downy mildew, then you are definitely going to see a reduction in yield because the crop's going to be compromised right in the beginning of the season itself. Uh, some of these right here, the mix of azoxystrobin, fludinoxal, and mefenaxin, these are all old chemistries which did not seem to be effective in all in the four locations. But right here, we've got this oxythiopropylin that seems to be working um, against downy mildew. I don't have yield data for this trial because um, we did not, we, we just, uh, the, the purpose of this study really was to check and see if the seed count could be, if the seed could be protected from downy mildew or not. And that's just because the downy mildew organism, um, it literally hits the sunflowers at the seedling stage. So out here, uh, this is what it looks like for downy mildew. So this is our inoculated trial where the organism was kind of introduced into the field. Compare that with any of the plots where the seed treatment went in, you can see a big difference in the, uh, in the seedling growth. So this is at the late vegetative um, stage. Um, we, this trial was again repeated in 2015. Um, again, we're showing that the oxythiopropylene seems to be effective against downy mildew as compared to the azoxystrobin, um, which is the QI chemistry. Then we've got the firma black stem. Um, this is a disease that has been very common um, in all sunflower producing areas. So compare that with rust or formopsis stem canker, it likes a little more warmer conditions, I wanna say drier conditions. And what you would see on the plant is this typical black colored lesion. It looks very similar to formopsis, but formopsis lesion tends to be tan colored. And the one for Forma tends to be a little darker. It could be anywhere between like coffee brown to like a black colored lesion. So the disease is fairly common. The lesions tend to be a lot smaller compared to Formopsis stem canker. The yield losses though in the United States has not been negligible. Although there has been studies, I wanna say like in 1960s or 70s out of South Dakota where they showed at least a 60% reduction in yield. 
but we've not had the history repeat again. Um, although we see the disease all over the place. In Europe, this disease is very common and they have reported ear losses of about 30% at least. So some of the other symptoms that you would see from former would be the typical lesions on the leaf. We've also got some discoloration on the petiole and this is uh, typically the starting of the former lesion. And on an infected plant, um, this is like you know, um, you can see the black colored lesion of different sizes that is very characteristic of former. And this would be way in the advanced stages where you've got some bleaching. Um, bleaching may not be from former, it could be from sparatinia, but you've got a mixed infection happening here. The black is typically the former lesion. So this is another close up um, right here. Um, we've got former is right here. We've got um, and so some of these lesions tend to be very superficial. So if you use your, if you use a knife and just, you know, kind of scratch it against the plant, you would not see anything inside. So it appears very superficial though. That's another way to tell them apart between say scrotinia from abscess and former. Former's lesion is very superficial. So right here, I just got a few pictures to tell the difference between the three diseases. I've got former right here on the left side. It's black in color. The side, the lesion tends to be smaller. Compare that with formopsis, which is more tan colored, and it kind of spreads from the node up and down. So it's a lot longer and tan colored lesion. And what I have here on the right side is cartinia, um, or the white mold fungus. The fungus produces cottony growth on the plant. You cut the stem, you should see some black bodies that is very typical of the white mold fungus. And the stem appears to be bleached compared to formopsis or forma. They kind of tend to be very difficult to tell them about. So it is very important that you scout your field for these diseases. The timing for these diseases tends to be the same. They could be occurring anywhere after the flowers have gone through the bloom stage. You could also see mixed infection. So this particular plant here has got a mix of formopsis and forma. So this long lesion would be a formopsis, it's tan colored. And this shorter lesion is forma black stem. It's black in color, but see the size is kind of different. But this mixed infection is also very common on the plants, um, especially here in South Dakota. This is another uh, picture of mixed infection. The stem appears bleached out and um, it's shredded and that's from the white mold fungus. You've got former uh, lesions right here, which is again black in color, but this is the mixed infection. Mixed infection is always dangerous because you know you are basically, you've lost the crop to that ear loss. So um, the, although the conditions driving these diseases can change, once again, it's not uncommon to see this mixed infection in the field. So what I have here, um, again, a quick reminder on the growth stages. So this is your R1 growth stage right here. You've got the R5 right here. And then this is going to be like a V8 growth stage. It is basically the number of true leaves, but there is no head, no floral head, a miniature floral head or a bloom that's on the top. So this is the vegetative phase. You've got the two reproductive growth stages right here. Um, so what we've done, um, so this is again data coming from North Dakota. So one of the things is we initiated a few fungicide trials for um, seeing their efficacy against former black stem. And one of the key reasons for starting this off is because most commercial hybrids that we have here in the United States do not have any level of resistance against former black stem. But again, former black stem is not uh, something is it does not cause as much e losses as one can associate with white mold fungus or formosa stem canker. Regardless, given the history, like it's happened in South Dakota one time, or it is a very common disease out in Europe, we decided to try to see if there are any fungicides that are working. And as part of this study, what we have done is uh, we have used multiple timings. So you've got a V8, which is your late vegetative, R1 and R5. And we have also used combinations to see if two applications, three applications are going to work. So this was periclostrobin, that's your headline at six furlongs per acre, 
what we saw was a big reduction again at R1 growth stage. And of course, the two applications also seems to reduce the disease much lower. <clears throat> Excuse me. In terms of yield, a single application, um, you are able to see some numerical differences right here. It's probably at least 100, 200 pound increase if you spray versus you're not spraying. But it seems like two applications of the fungicide or three applications of the fungicide seems to do well. But QI is a group of fungicide that we know wherein fungi that infects or causes disease on most crops have the tendency to develop resistance in the long run. So we don't typically recommend that farmers use QI fungicides in sequence, meaning you don't want to use like two, three applications in a growing season. Up to a single application, um, it seems that the products containing QI is effective against diseases like former black stem or, or from stem canker. Uh, this is another, um, and this is from a subsequent year, 2018 to 2019. Um, again, different chemistries was uh, tried at um, R1 growth stage. Uh, besides the QI, just given the history of um, the uh, of QI uh, inducing resistance in fungi in other crops, we don't have any reports on sunflowers, but we definitely do have reports out in soybeans and um, in other crops in, from other states. We have one of the things that we are doing is to try other chemistries. And so in this research from this particular location, Devonport, North Dakota, we also saw there was a significant reduction in disease severity when SDHI, and many of you would relate that to Endura, which is also used for uh, spraying against white mold, seems to be effective against former black stem. So what this graph is, uh, the non-treated control is usually, you have a disease index of, of five. Um, and as smaller the bars, it means that the fungicide is effective against the uh, disease. Um, this is in terms of yield. So in yield, this is your non-treated control. We got a hardly a 2,300 pounds per acre. Taller the bar means the fungicide is working. And there are several chemistries that seems to be giving us at least a 400 pound per acre increase. And they include the QIs. Um, you've got like a combination of STHI and DMIs and um, you've got other um, chemistries too that's working, a combination of triazol, STHI and QI. So there are chemistries out there that seems to be working against former black stem. And that's always good news for us, especially when we don't have genetics available that can protect the crop from fungal diseases. So in summary, what I have, uh, these the diseases that I mentioned today, uh, that includes the Formopsis stem canker, rust, scratching diseases, downy mildew, and former black stem, they have gained a lot of importance, at least in the last five years, not just in South Dakota, but in, but in, men, men, in the major sunflower producing states in the United States, which includes Minnesota and North Dakota. Um, Management options based off this presentation may sound limited, but it is always best to check with seed dealers on the genetics that we have available. We do have some level of resistance available to Formopsis stem canker and Sclerotinia head rot. There's also resistance available to rust and downy mildew. What we may not have resistance would be to former black stem or any other diseases that you can think on on sunflowers. That's where crop rotation becomes very important. Um, wheat is a great uh, crop to rotate sunflowers with because many of the diseases that I discussed today do not infect wheat. The rust fungus that infects wheat is different from that the one that infects sunflower. From mouse stem canker, from a black stem, white mold, those, the fungi that causes those diseases do not infect wheat. So crop rotation becomes very important this is like a cheat sheet for fungicides. They are not going to be like a, like a silver bullet, but they're definitely an option while we work towards improving the genetics that we have for sunflowers. Um, so just as a summary, uh, from Opsis stem canker, we recommend a single application of a QI, specifically periclistrobin at R1. From a black stem, um, we recommend again a QI or SDHI at both V8 and R1. Um, rust. It's R5, 
but one of the things to check is the disease severity. If it's 1% in the upper four leaves of the plant, then you, one could be spraying either QI or triazole or fungicides. Sclerotinia your head rot, um, based on a few of the fungicides that are labeled, the effective timing would be between 5.2 to 5.7, and we recommend the use of SDHI. And downy mildew, foliar fungicides don't work. So that is one place where you don't have to necessarily worry about growth stage. It's pretty much managed by use of seed treatment and genetics. And um, before I leave it, before I finish my seminar here, I just wanted to quickly acknowledge uh, the funding agencies. We've got the USDA, the South Dakota Oil Seeds Council, the National Sunflower Association for funding a lot of the projects that was presented today. And also many of these projects are done in collaboration with NDSU and University of Nebraska-Lincoln. With that, I, um, I'm open to questions and I just wanted to quickly um, leave it at the growth stage in case anybody's wondering the V8, R1, R5, so. I should have put that slide at the end, but I kind of forgot, so sorry about that. Ruth, um, I think you're muted. I can see you. Uh... Sorry, yep, yep. Thanks, Fabina, that, you know, you covered a lot of ground in your presentation and um, it was really, really good to hear some of that information and all, we all need to be reminded of the growth stages, I think, in sunflowers. So um, that was great information. So I just gonna, you know, ask people again, if, if you've got questions that you wanna uh, direct at Fabina or, or anyone else on the panel here, uh, please type those in the question and answer feature and, and we'll address them or you can put them in the chat as well um, and we'll try to watch those. Um, I guess um, we will be showing the QR code for CCA credits in a couple of minutes and Pat will do that. Um, there are a few things in the, um, in the chat that uh, Pat Wagner has been sharing and, and that is if you want to order any hard copies of our uh, pest, pest management guides for 2021. Um, there's a, a link there that you can go to and you can order those management guides, but also there's a number of other publications if you're interested in any of that. Um, and also, if any of you want to watch this record, this video or this the taping of this uh, presentation again or any of the other um, recordings that we've done, seminars we've done over the winter, those will be all available at the SDSU Extension YouTube channel, and you can go see that link as well in the chat. Um, looks like we got a couple questions here. Um, so uh, the first one is, how, they'd like to know how common it is to have more than one disease at a time. If so, what's the best approach for management? That's a very good question. So from my experience, if once the sunflower hits the reproductive phases, especially like if you get out to the field uh, when it's blooming, post the bloom, you're likely to see at least, uh, you know, the diseases like from out stem canker, white mold, rust, from our black stem. Again, it is really dependent on the field history. So if in the, what I, usually tell the farmers is that in the last five years, if you think about what you've seen in your field, then one of the big things to do would be to check with the seed dealer, like, uh, do I have genetics for disease A, B, C? So if you've seen rust from Ophsos keratinia, best is to ask them, do you have any genetics available that I could use? And if they have some genetics available, um, then the next question is, have you seen, uh, if you've seen the disease, how bad is the disease pressure? Has it been like where you cannot manage it at all, although you've tried different varieties? If so, then a fungicide application is warranted. And um, so fungicide applications can be common, for example, against Fumopsis stem canker and Pharma, it would be a single application at R1. Rust, however, an application at R1 is not going to work and that's where the application at R5 comes into the picture, but, the, uh, but even the scratinia disease is also, it's only for head rot where we see some improvement using fungicide, but the chemistry again varies. So, so in summary, the best approach would be start with the genetics. That's where the seed dealers are very helpful. And then your second um, shot would be using fungicides. 
Um, there's of course crop rotations. And um, as I indicated, I know nobody does sunflower over sunflower. There's of course options to, you know, if one would rotate it with corn or wheat. Um, it really depends on, um, on, on your farming operations, how you, what, how you would proceed for the season. But those are the best ways uh, that you can manage some flower diseases. Yep, thanks, Veena. You know, I, I guess I can just add that it, it is very common to see more than one disease at a time in sunflowers, I guess. I feel like, you know, when we have more humidity in a wetter year, we'll often see a bigger hit on the disease end of things in our sunflowers. So um, there are two QR codes for those of you who are um, crop consultants. Uh, so we applied for um, a half credit in crop management and a half credit in pest management. So those are up there now and um, scan them. Use your phone to scan those if you can. So. so our next question is, sunflower is often planted after corn, which is often after wheat. Um, the individual is wondering if you think you would see more disease after when you, if you put your sunflowers in after wheat versus after corn? So that is a good question. So if I understand the question correctly, if the crop sequence is like wheat, corn, sunflower, is that correct? Uh, the crop sequence here, um, we usually sneak that sunflower in between the corn between? and okay. the wheat because the reason for that, that, to my knowledge anyways, is the fusarium that would be a problem going from the corn residue into the wheat. Right. So then so, yeah. that's common. Yeah. So, so, okay, so based off this question, if it's wheat, sunflower, um, and then corn, do you see, um, just wondering if you see more disease pressure after corn versus wheat? I, we have not compared to see if there is a more disease uh, between uh, after corn or wheat. From my experience, some of the diseases like from up system canker, we don't see a whole lot after, if you plant sunflower after corn. Um, but, I, but again, I have not compared that from, uh, you know, when, if you do wheat and then sunflower. But like Ruth indicated, if uh, fusarium diseases like scab is going to, if you've had a year of scab on your wheat, then you probably want to break it, break that cycle with sunflowers. Um, and then the following year, um, it again depends back on the disease history. If you have, for example, white mold and you've done soybean, wheat and then sunflower and you've seen some white mold issue on soybean and then you are probably going to be setting up the sunflower to be susceptible to white mold provided it's going to be a wet year um, but um, th th that's I guess that's the only comment I have there I don't know Ruth you have more to add on that I, I don't know if there would be a, a sunflower grower on the call that might when when they become unmuted could comment but my understanding was that wheat used to be planted, sunflowers used to be planted after wheat, but then when we started to see more head scab in the area, that's when they, uh, or sorry, corn used to be planted before wheat or after wheat. But then we started to see more fusarium issues. So that's when they placed the sunflowers between those two crops. And that has helped is my understanding. But again, I, I don't, know that I think that was more before my time or early very early in my career so uh, some of the sunflower growers may recall that um, so the next question is they're asking if priaxor or astrobi would be better return on investment so that, that's a good question so priaxor has got the same strobi as what you would have um, in headline um, and so as far as the return on investment, when we have evaluated pre against like uh, Fumopsis stem canker or, uh, uh, you know, like Puma black stem, um, the yield benefit is anywhere, it, it's, it's the same. It's like 5% or 6% um, you know, compared to your check where you have not sprayed the uh, fungicide at all. So, it's the, so the effect is the same. The strobe is present in the preaxer already, so. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, there is a survey there that we appreciate if people just take, you know, a moment or two to fill out. Um, 
we've been getting a lot of information from the surveys from this winter and that really helps all of us to you know direct our our future activities and and know where um the producers in south dakota um you know what what they're looking for to hear from us so that's gonna if you guys would take a few minutes to fill that out we appreciate it uh, I have a question for yes. for you, Fabina. So yeah. you talked a little bit about um, the sclerotia bodies in the soil. Yes. Um, and so my question to you is, how long do you think those live in the soil? So from the research that we have, it um, in the, it's at least, I, I believe it's at least three to five years. Um, and I don't know if there is a dif if there is differences because. The sclerotia size kind of varies from crop to crop. Like you compare the sclerotia that is formed on soybean versus sunflowers. Um, and I, I don't know if it is a reality, but then somebody told me that the sclerotia actually mimics the side, the size of the seed. So, you know, the soybean seed tends to be smaller and sunflower seed tends to be big, like compared with confection seeds. And so it really depends on the size and shape of sclerotia, but ideally anywhere between three to five, you know, that would give it enough time to survive. Um, on the uh, yeah, so. so so that's that would be a value to people who do run into that disease, you know, to maybe mm -hmm. remember to um, maybe stretch the rotation a little bit and stay away from soybeans as well as sunflowers in those fields. Right, would, right. Would you yeah. Say? yeah. Yes, I would. Yeah. yeah. Um, I I don't know how much uh, alfalfa is popular in you know in that area, but I do occasionally see that coming up. Alfalfa also could be a good host of this uh, white mold fungus. So yeah. wheat and corn would be your best bet. Uh, even the pulse crops like pea, lentil, chickpeas, they're all good hosts of uh, white mold. Although we don't see it in South Dakota, like it's been, you know, it's, it's known, it's a known fact that they could also host, um, canola is another one. We don't have a lot of production of canola in South Dakota, but that's also another crop that's very susceptible to white mold. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the research just varies uh, on how long the sclerotia can live in the soil. But my understanding of sclerotinia and sunflowers has always been that it's a much more complicated disease because it has three different ways of entering the plant and is the plants don't respond to a fungicide application like we would see maybe in soybeans and, and um, canola. That's right. I think one of the major challenges we have with spraying fungicide is uh, the, you know, the architecture of the plant. I mean, the crop looks way different from like spraying, spraying it on soybean or wheat or corn. And so a lot of the times we uh, would think that uh, we have the right um, equipment. You know, you know, it's still a ground sprayer or an aerial spray you would use to spray fungicides on sunflowers. But, uh, but I know there's been research done by Michael Wunsch out at NDSU where he's tried different nozzle types and nozzle pressures to see if there is something that would actually work in a way that the fungicide can fall easily um, on the crop and protect it from the fungus that is attacking. So that's been a challenge. And that's where, you know, um, if we, we're seeing some efficacy um, against scratching a head rot but we have not been able to establish that the fungicides are going to work against midstock rot or basal stem rot because we just can't get the fungicide that far into the crop. Mm -hmm. So that's been a major challenge uh, with fungicide application. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, um, we, we had, you know, some issues um, the year 2019, but other than that, I, I feel like sclerotinia, we've been somewhat fortunate in central yes. and western South Dakota and I, yeah. I think it's our dry conditions. Yeah, I know I agree sometimes, with you. Ruth. Sometimes we complain but there's some benefits too. So yeah I agree with you because I I you know coming from North Dakota I've probably seen more uh, head rot up there uh, up north or, or in Minnesota area than I've seen here down in South Dakota. It's just that one year when we had the NSA survey when I saw quite a bit of uh, Sclerotinia here and there in the fields, but it's not like the entire field is just like you know a section. Like you can count on the on your finger like the number of plants that might be affected. I don't know if I've seen anything dramatic. Okay, um, there is another question in the chat here. Um, somebody is asking, um, are there any disease control trials of Alternaria leaf spot done in South Dakota? 
So one of the things that we are starting in 2021 would be to assess the efficacy of fungicide against alternaria leaf spot. And that's in my list of things to do. Um, it's, it's not been an economically important uh, disease in the United States, um, uh, the uh, alternaria leaf spots. So there's not been a lot of attention given to that. But it's a disease that we get asked over and over again as we present on sunflower diseases in multiple states. So it's something on my list of you know things to do for this season, and to get some data. So soon you will be have you will be able to see some data for that um, in the coming years. Yeah. Um, I don't see anything else at the moment. I don't know if um, we could we could probably put people in the chat room now, Matt, if, if, that, if that's okay. And, and then if people wanted to unmute to join us um, and unmute and ask questions, I, I know there's a lot of sunflower people, growers on the call. And um, I really respect all the, you know, the things that they've taught me over the years. So I, I hope some of them I'm on, on mute, maybe provide some comments or some of their tell us about some of their experiences or thoughts and tomorrow we're going to have um, Adam Varenhorst, our um, SDSU entomology specialist and uh, he's going to talk on above and below ground insect pests in sunflowers so I hope those people who are on today will come back tomorrow and and join us again so but um, so I don't I don't know if anybody would has any other questions? I, I one thing I was gonna mention. Um, let's see, what did I do with it? Oh, I was just gonna show people that I don't know if you can see this is a great disease. It's hard to see, but it's a flip book. Uh, Fabina is one of the authors on it. It was produced. It's got all the sunflower diseases. It's got great pictures. Um, we have them here in the Peer Center if people are interested in would like one, they can contact us and we can mail it out or get it to you somehow. So um, it's it's a great document. 